This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3271 Lecture 25 on fuselage and winged analysis where we're going to idealize it as lumped skin and stringer. It's useful to recall what we learned in Arrow 3261, actually all the way in back in statics Arrow 2041, how to calculate the properties of lumped areas. We simply idealize our section, label everything, make a table, report where the, where, what the areas are and where they're located, calculate the first moments of the area about the reference axis, and then we calculate the CG from that. Now that we have the CG, we can calculate our I for each of these sections. We learned all this in statics. We've been using that throughout arrow 3261 and also in 3271. Now when we're talking about aircraft structures it's useful to use a couple approximations. We also introduced these in statics and reinforced them in arrow 3261. And basically that's when we have a cylindrical shell with very thin skin, the area, while it is given by this first formula and the moment of inertia by the second, we can write the approximation as 2 pi r t and pi r cubed t. These are useful approximations for thin structures, which are a little simpler because often we're going to have a radius and we're going to have a thickness. Now the question is, what radius? Well, in both these cases, that would be the mid-plane radius. Although often when we're talking about this lumped assumption, we talk about the radius of a fuselage, it can get a little lost in the weeds whether the radius that's being reported of the fuselage is the inner, outer, or mid plane. Usually it would be like an outer radius of the fuselage, but it really could be any of those numbers. And we usually will just take that radius without adjustment and use that as if it's the mid plane radius. Now also we covered in statics how to go and, and approximate the bending properties of a fuselage. So we're actually going to go back through some of the things we looked at before. We're going to look at a number of different methods. We're going to look at uh, four different ways of idealizing the fuselage that are going to lay the groundwork for what we're going to do, but they are not what we're going to do. So first let's look at a fuselage structure. So that means we have a thin skin and a bunch of stringers. Those stringers can't be at the skin center line. They're offset. The centroid of that stringer does not lie on the skin itself. It lies inside the skin, as you can see here. Let's look quickly at a few stringers. What we see here are Z stringers. These stringers each lie on the skin. So when we're talking about the CG, what we're talking about is the distance from here to the centroid of that stringer with no skin considered. Now you can see when we're talking up here, then that Y bar goes from there to here. When we're down here, it's from here to here as we see in this picture. And as you rotate your stringer, you're going to have to do the trig to rotate what that offset is. If you really want to understand the best properties you can, you would take the stringer properties, you take the moment of inertia of the stringer about its own centroidal axis, and you take the area of the stringer at the point where the centroid of the stringer is located, and then we would add those properties to the moment of inertia of the skin itself. That's what we're going to look at in our first idealization where we account for the position of the area, but we're first going to neglect this I, and then we're going to consider it on a different slide and we're going to compare the results. So for this idealization here, we're going to count for the skin. We're going to count for the stringers as if the areas are offset, but that each stringer has no bending stiffness. That's going to be our first idealization, and this is for reference only. We're not going to use this approach. So we have a fuselage of radius r. We, in this particular case, we're going to say we have 12 stringers. Let's say that they're spaced at 30 degrees. So your stringers can be laid out when somebody does the design. They can say that you have stringers every so many degrees 
or maybe so many inches as you move tangent along the skin. That's commonly called out also. We're accounting for the stringer centroid offset. That means, once again, we've got the skin wherever it's located at a radius r, and we've got each stringer's area lumped at the point where the CG of those stringers are. And if we account for our properties that way, what we're going to need to do is locate on an XY kind of axis what the X and Y position of each stringer is. Now we have to make the decision where our first stringer is. It's very common to put the first stringer at the top. It's also fairly common to have the two stringers offset. So if this is our angle theta, the, each one is like half of a theta from the center line. So we got to decide are we talking about a central stiffener in the top or split center where each one is to the side. Usually the two sides of the, of the fuselage are symmetric except for changes associated with door cutouts and other things like that. Okay, so in this particular case we've got our first stringer right at the zero vertical center line and we've got 12 stiffeners evenly spaced throughout. So our radius of the skin is 60 inches, our thickness is this, our stringer area is that, and if we also have the properties of this, we've neglected the bending stiffness of these, we would construct a table like this. You'll notice to the left in our second column, in our first column we have the number of each stringer and we have a spot for the skin. In the second column we have the area of each stringer and the area of the skin using our lumped 2 pi r t assumption. We then have the position of each stringer as a function of its angular position. The, string, the skin itself is right there in the middle. And then we can calculate for the centroid offset what the X bar and the Y position of each and every stringer is. And we see the skin is centered at the center line. Once we have done this, this is the only thing really new for evaluating fuselage, we then can calculate our, a, our area times our x and our area times our y. We can use that to calculate our centroid and then go on to calculate the moments of inertia of this fuselage based on the moment of inertia of the position of each stiffener, a times x minus x bar squared. Once again, the skin was located at the center line, so that doesn't have a moment of inertia due to being offset but it does have a moment of inertia about its own axis, which we will consider, that's that 40,600, which is based on our approximate I value. Note that these parts of the table are the only thing that's different from all the other properties we calculate for lump stringers. We have the area, we have a theta, we have an X bar and a Y bar. That's the only thing that's special about this fuselage analysis and the decision that the centroid of the stiffener is offset, that we're using the full effective width skins, which means all of the skin, and that we're neglecting the bending stiffness of the stringers. Everything else in this table, all the stuff over here, is just calculating properties like normal. With that said, our properties for this fuselage are this. We see that our area is 25 square inches. Our moments of inertia are about 44,000 inches to the fourth. Now once again, we're not going to use this method. This is giving us a building block of understanding. We can see that the skin provides 40,000 of the 44.8 thousand inches to the fourth of moment of inertia. What that means is, while the stringers have some effect, the skin, if it were fully effective, has a huge moment of inertia. Now this moment of inertia of the skin is actually not correct. As we think back on what we've learned about stability of cylinders loaded in compression or bending, we can see that they buckle at a relatively low load and therefore this is actually not very representative of reality even though analytically it's correct. So we're going to look at some other ways to idealize this structure. Now this is the same fuselage with nearly the same idealization. The only thing that's different is we're going to add bending of each stiffener about its own axis. When we do that, we construct our table in the same manner as before. You'll notice we now have these columns populated, the moment of inertia about the X and Y axis for these stringers. 
What that means is we've got to calculate the moment of inertia about its own axis when it's sitting like this. And then we need to rotate it through trig to account for what's the moment of inertia about the x and the y for all other orientations of these stringers. If we do that, we end up finding these properties. Now if we compare these numbers to what we calculated on the last slide where we neglected the bending stiffness of the stringers, we find we have a 0.02%. That's not 2%, that's 0.02%. That's not even two tenths of a percent, that's two hundredths of a percent. That means all that work to account for the moment of inertia of each stringer about its own axis is a complete waste of time. Now, if you're doing this with a program, you might as well calculate it, not a big deal. But we can actually do a lot of analysis by hand or using Excel and adding the complexity of putting the moment of inertia of the stringer, while it offers a 0.02% benefit, the chance that error will enter your calculation due to the complexity that's added increases so significantly that it's not worth doing. So we often will neglect or almost always neglect the bending stiffness of the of the stringers when we're calculating fuselage properties because they just don't matter that much for that purpose. Now that doesn't mean we don't use it for other things. Okay, now we're going to adjust our idealization again. Since we saw that huge moment of inertia when we used full effective skin, but we realized that if any of this fuselage is in compression, the skin will not be able to develop full effective widths. So the next thing we can try is putting in 30T of effective width. So once again, we can use the real effective width for our skin, but the 30T approximation is a reasonable one that's commonly used. So if we just go with that simplification of 30T, and instead of using the entire effective width of the skin, what we're going to do is use the effective width of skin that's associated with the stringer. So if we focus on the upper stringer, that means we're going to have whatever this effective width of skin is, WEFF, acting with it, and this much with this stringer, and this much with this stringer, and so on. If we go, and this time what we're going to do is we're going to remove the skin for my idealization, but in each column of our table, when we put in our area, we will just take the area of our stringer and we will add in the effective width of the skin that works with it. If we then plug in that combined area in our area column, once again we're going to continue to use this offset CG. So we're just going to lump that. Now actually if you put the effective width of skin in with a stringer, it's going to move the CG of the stringer from here to about here. We could account for that shift or not. This particular analysis does not account for it. It just dumps it all at the original CG. But we certainly could calculate a new CG of that combination and plug that in. That would improve our idealization. But basically, looking at the exact same analysis we did in the last one, once again, we're still neglecting the bending stiffness of our stringer about its own axis. But lumping instead of all of the skin, we're using 30T of skin, we're going to get a table like this, which results in properties like this. You'll notice the area goes up because we now have the effective width of skin. And we still are neglecting the eye of all the stringers about their own axis. And now we have removed that eye of the skin because we're not using full effective width of skin. We're actually getting the, the benefit of the skin based on where each little effective width of area is located when they're lumped with the skin. That gives us properties like this. Now if we look at the bending stiffness, we find that the bending stiffness is significantly different. Remember we had like 44,000 inches to the fourth or something like that of moment of inertia and when and that was for a full effective width of skin if we only use 30t of effective width of skin we're down to about 6400 this is a huge difference this means we cannot just plug in the full effective width of skin without considering 
what kind of stresses occur in the skin and whether or not the skin is compression. We're not going to use this either because actually we have more effective skin than just 30T. Anywhere we're in tension we're going to get more skin effective than just 30T. Now we're still in all this analysis. Now we've got this 30T of effective width of skin but we're still using this offset of the CG of each and every stringer. Now while that is, uh, as you can see here in these columns, if this was right at the center of the skin, then this would be 60, it'd be the radius, but it's offset by the CG of the stringer. Now it's actually more accurate to account for where each of these stringers are located to account for this offset like shown here. But let's go ahead and look at what is the difference if we neglect the offset of the stringer. If we were just to pretend that the stringer area occurs right at the center of the skin where the stringer interfaces with the skin, that would be another idealization. That's what we're going to study on the next slide. So now we're using that assumption. It's the same as the last slide. We're still neglecting the bending stiffness of the stringer about their, its own axis. And this time we're also neglecting the offset of each stringer. We're still using 30T of effective width of skin and that gives us these properties. And we find that the difference to the last slide is about 3%, a little over 3% difference. So that's not zero. But that's basically for all these other assumptions we're using, that is negligible enough. We uh, are actually, no matter how we idealize our fuselage, we're going to end up with uh, more error than that for every assumption we might make. So this is an acceptable level of error. So we actually can simplify our analysis greater by just uh, accounting for where all of the stringers are and placing them right at the center line of the skin at the place where they interface. Okay, So what this is is the last of our four methods that kind of evaluate the effects of different assumptions. And now before moving on we're going to look at, we're going to summarize what those effects were and then we're going to go and look at our approach. So if we think back to what we've seen, we've looked at three idealizations. We've looked at the stringer position, where we account for the stringer position, but neglect the moment of inertia of the stringer. But we use a, we idealize the skin as full effective widths. We found out that was too big. We looked at stringer position and moment of inertia plus full effective width of skins. We looked at stringer position, but neglected moment of inertia plus 30T of effective width of skins. Actually, we looked at a fourth. We also looked at the stringer position neglected and its moment of inertia plus the other. So we actually looked at four idealizations. And the fourth is where we neglected stringer position and we neglected stringer moment of inertia but retained this 30T of effective width of skin. All of these missed the boat for representing reality. Therefore we can make these observations. When we accounted for the stringer moment of inertia, it added complexity but had a completely negligible difference. Therefore, we don't need to do that. When we accounted for the Stringer CG offset, it made a small difference, like 3.4% max. But that also is negligible, so we can neglect that detail, although if you want to account for it, that does have some value. We then assumed full effect of width of skins, and we saw that that overpredicts the moment of inertia of the fuselage if there's any compression on the skin anywhere. We looked at 30T of effective width of skin, but we found that that under predicts the moment of inertia if there's any of the skin that's not in compression. This leads us to our own approach, which can be considered a best practice of, so, of sorts for simple but effective fuselage properties. The kind of analysis will be fine for your design projects and actually for a lot of work in industry. We're going to idealize the skin as being infinitesimally thin, which means we actually don't have to account for the whether the radius is at the inner, outer, or midplane. The midplane is the best place to use it, but you actually can use any of those spots and just neglect any differences. We can approximate our stiffness. Stiffeners is located right at the center of the skin's midplane, which means all we need to do is find their positions find the position of the stringer where it intersects the skin as you go around the fuselage and use those values. That simplifies things a bit. We're going to neglect the stringer bending stiffness because that had nearly no effect. And the best way would be to use a combination 
a full effective width for any skin that's in tension and 30T of effective width of skin for any skin that's in compression. Now uh, there are reasons like shear lag effects and some other advanced effects why many companies and often in analysis we won't ever use the full effective width of skin except for a pure pressure case usually if we have any kind of inertia load we will use less than the full effective width of skin. We've used numbers like 4.4 inches for some commercial aircraft uh, but something less than full effective width is really valid but what we're going to do is use full effective width of skin and we're going to use 30T of effective width of skin for compression. Now what we really could do is calculate what the true effective width is for our skin properties and configuration. But for this kind of analysis because this analysis is usually done before a lot of details of the stringers and skin and frames are determined just using 30T is a nice simple approximation which is really close enough for government work. That's what we're going to do. So since our the effective width that we're going to use is a function of the stresses in the skin, we're going to need to iterate to get the properties. And the next couple slides are going to tell us how that's done. Our first step is going to be to analyze the fuselage for full effective width skins. So we can just pretend that the skin is fully effective and blindly run through our analysis. We're going to ignore the offset of the stringers. We're going to ignore the bending stiffness of the stringers. We're just going to calculate what the theta position is, where each stringer is located. We're going to use that information as is shown here. We're going to use that information to calculate the Y of the stringer from trig. We're going to take the area of the stringer and the effective width of skin. Now you can calculate for full effective width, you can calculate the effective width of skin is just 2 pi r divided by the number of stringers. Later we can change that with better estimates of the effective width of skin. Now the area of the skin then is just that effective width of skin times the thickness and the total area for each skin stringer combination is the summation of this area and this area to provide this area. We now use this area and multiply it by our y to get our first moment of the area. We take the summation of that divided by the summation of the area to calculate our moment of inertia. Now we're showing it about one axis for bending about a horizontal axis. We can actually do it about both properties. We then can calculate our moment of inertia due to this area being offset by y minus y bar squared. That gives us this column and since we're neglecting the bending stiffness of the stringers about their own axis and since the skin is already included in the stringer areas be, through this effective width approach that value here now becomes our moment of inertia that's effective. Once again this is 13,000 inches to the fourth notice we're using this idealization is 15 stringers with a radius of 40 inches. Last one was 12 stringers so we had fewer stringers and we had a larger radius. That's why we've got a different moment of inertia. Once we have our moment of inertia we can calculate our stresses just using our standard equation MC over I to calculate the stress on every stringer. Now notice for a minute that some of these are in tension. Any of these stresses that are in tension means the effective width that we used is valid. Some of these are in compression, these guys. All of these that are in compression, this is too much effective width. So we're going to have to adjust the effective width for any of our skin that's in compression and this is the corresponding forces associated with that. You can ignore that column for now because we're going to go and fix this idealization. Now we're going to go and change the effective width for every stringer that's in compression. We're going to do that on the next slide. So bear with me. Ready? So we're going to take what we did before and now if we go into our table 
And for any of those stringers that we saw stresses of compression, we change the effective width. So the effective width for those becomes less. Now what I did, rather than changing them all, because you're going to end up iterating, what I did was just change, and you can use your own approach, you can either change everything that's in compression or just change the bottom two stringers. Actually, that doesn't hurt to change these bottom two to the effective width to the 30T of skin. And then look at the stresses. You see we've got more of these than we changed in compression. That means we're going to have to do it again. Change these two. And then that's going to give us a distribution. Then change these two. And that's going to give us... And when we finally end up so that everywhere that's compression has a 30T effective width of skin and everywhere that's in tension has a full effective width of skin, that will be our best estimate for using this approach. So our third step is now to iterate by, by making more and more of these areas, the 30T rather than the full effective width of skin, until everywhere that has a negative stress has a 30T effective width of skin and everywhere that has a positive stress has a full effective width of skin. We will see that finished on the next slide. So going through that approach, if we iterate, we go until we find convergence, which basically means everywhere we have a compression skin, we have 30T of skin. You'll notice from here to here. And since the stresses change with every change of effective width, you need to iterate until you find the spot. You'll notice everywhere that's in compression has 30T of effective width of skin. Everywhere where the stresses are in tension has full effective width of skin. This is a valid approximation of the fuselage properties now because we've accounted for the change in effective width based on the stresses in the skin. If the skin is in tension, it may be able to develop its full effective width, meaning all of it adds to the stiffness. If it's in compression, the best we will be able to do is our effective width of skin. And now our moment of inertia we see is about 7,000. You'll notice when we started this out with full effective width of skin, we had a moment of inertia of about 13,000 inches to the fourth. When we change just two stringers to the effective width of skin, we drop down to 11,000. And now once we have finished the process of iterating until all of our compression stringers are using 30T of effective width of skin, we find that the best estimate for the moment of inertia of the fuselage is about 7,000. That means that the stresses that we see here in this column are now valid. We can calculate the force in each stringer by just multiplying by the area of the stringer. That means the area of the skin plus stringer, this guy here, will give you what the force in each is. Now we can go and compare these kind of numbers, obviously, to our crippling allowable and our buckling allowable. So we've got the Euler buckling allowable of each stringer when we use the length between the frames with a pinned condition. We can compare that to the Euler-Johnson allowable, make sure that shows positive margin, and that will account for both crippling and Euler buckling, right? We can then go and look at the max tension stresses, and those will rarely be critical, but we ought to look at that too against up to you. That's obviously not critical. This is obviously critical down here at the bottom center line where we're in compression. Now these numbers are valid approximations of our stresses in the skin that we then can analyze. So what we saw is full effective width of skin is unconservative, 30T is too conservative. We need to actually evaluate our stresses in order to get effective widths for the skins that are correct. Different load cases may get different properties. Obviously, a downbending load case where we have compression on the bottom will give different properties than a side bending load case. And if we have downbending without pressure and downbending with pressure, that will give different properties. So you can end up having different properties for each and every load case. That is a lot of work. And just running a finite element model 
with one of those approximations doesn't really improve our answer because you have the same problem buried in your analysis it just is less visible what your assumptions were so what we need to do is evaluate smart properties we will use this approach which was shown as step one step two step three and note between step two and three there were a number of iterations to evaluate our property so what that means is we can go and calculate our loads and load factors we like we saw two lectures ago we then can distribute our loads on the fuselage or wing as we learned how to do last lecture we then get shear and bending moment diagrams for the fuselage and wing we then are going to look at our fuselage and we're going to use the assumption that wherever our stringers are we're just going to assume that they're lumped properties on the center line of the skin so each of these little guys is just a stringer with some effective width the effective width will either be 30 t or they will be the full effective widths which means from here to here so we're going to plug all those properties we're going to start by using the full effective width for each stringer and calculate our properties and then we're going to start adjusting our properties by changing the effective width of anything in compression until we get an eye where all the properties match if we have a wing it's basically the same procedure our wing shape is probably something like this and all the bending will generally occur between the front and aft spar so basically what we're going to do is take whatever our stringers are and we're going to pretend that they're lumped right at the center line of the skin and we can calculate whatever the positions are in this particular case it's probably best to set an axis down here define them all according to that until we get the centroidal properties of our wing and we can calculate our properties in exactly the same way as we did here we showed a three-step approach where we used full effective widths then we used uh, started switching out the effective widths and iterated until we got the final where everything was uh, all tension stresses had full effective widths and all compression stresses had 30 t of effective width and the same exact approach can be used for the wing then you can do your analysis and that is how uh, a nice simple way of doing fuselage analysis this is not only done in school this approach is used for a lot of post production work if you work for a large company like Boeing Airbus things like that they're generally going to do more detailed analysis to get their answer more accurate but a lot of post-production work which means analysis of modifications alterations and repairs is often done with gross simplifications like what we just covered and even simpler just one other word it's also common because there's so much work involved with calculating the exact effect of width for every idealization of skin and so on that we might have what's common is to use instead of using full effective width or even 30 T sometimes folks will just use some number in between like four inches or something around there for working with each stringer and they come up with one set of properties which is actually a prop approximate but not correct they'll use that in their finite element model to go and develop stresses and then when they do the stress analysis they will actually calculate the real properties and do analysis on the real properties not on that idealized set of properties these idealized set of properties are really forgetting the loads in each and every member so that's our basic approach you now are armed with what you need in order to do good simple analysis of aircraft structures enjoy